So uh, now we will we'll stay in the marine area, but above water as opposed to below. No, well, we will use, I, from what I've understood, and I'm really fascinated to hear about this work, we'll be uh, talking about, indeed, seabirds as a way of monitoring uh, the, the global changes in marine ecosystems. So thank you very much, uh, Henri, for coming to give us this presentation, and I, and I look forward to it. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk today. So we will continue in the marine environment, but on larger organisms that rely on the smaller organisms. And I will be talking uh, you on uh, a group we are working in my lab in uh, Shizé, uh, seabirds. And so uh, seabirds, Seabirds are well known to, for gathering in very large uh, colony like here uh, off the coast of Peru. It's a, a, a large colony of several species of guano birds that congregate here. Uh, but uh, seabirds, they rely entirely on what's happened at sea, in fact. They are, and for this reason, so they spend most of their time, 90 to 95% of their time, they spend it at sea, foraging for food, foraging for small organisms, for fish, for squid. Uh, crustaceans, and uh, for this reason, because they are accessible on land, but they are relying on what's happened at sea, they have been considered as, as quite a good indicator of the marine, what's happened in the marine environment. And uh, if we want, the idea is that if you want to know what's happened in the environment, especially there are very few information on what's happened from one year to the next, uh, at a lower level uh, in the marine ecosystem, in the trophic webs. The idea is to use uh, the seabirds that rely on some species, rely on crustaceans, other on small fish, on uh, mictophid fish, on larger cephalopods, for example, and looking at their abundance, uh, the change in abundance, and looking at their distribution will give you some idea of what's happened in the marine environment. And also, uh, because fisheries are having a very big impact and are, they are either exploiting or even for many species over exploiting resources in the environment, but also they have negative impact on many uh, marine predators like seabirds, sea turtles, sharks, many species. It's quite interesting also to use, and I will give you an example of using the seabirds as indicator of the uh, uh, fisheries in the, uh, especially of fisheries for whom we have very few information. So my talk will be divided in two parts. First, I will be talking to uh, you uh, about penguins and uh, uh, using them as indicator of climate change in the marine environment. And in the second part, I will be talking to you about albatrosses, uh, climate change, but also the relationship uh, with fisheries, and especially whether we can use them as sentinels, as indicator of uh, fisheries activities. So first, uh, in our lab in Shize, we have long-term long -term monitoring of uh, many seabird species in the Southern Ocean, from the Crozet, Kerguelen, Amsterdam, and uh, Terra Deli uh, uh, Bays, where we have uh, monitoring of species since more than 60 years. So we have for many species, the change in the population size, but also uh, survival rates, uh, breeding success, uh, recruitment in the population. But also, we are uh, uh, using a lot of uh, uh, small loggers that we can put on, the, on this bird uh, to have indication of where the birds are foraging and also what they are doing when they are foraging. So all the activity can be monitored with very small loggers that we can put, and I will be uh, giving you some example of what we can do with these small loggers. So first, let's talk about penguins, and I uh, will be uh, talking to you about uh, one species of penguin, king penguins, that are breeding on some Antarctic islands. They are breeding on the Crozet and Kerguelen Island, especially. They are gathering in very large colonies, like you can see uh, here, uh, uh, in, uh, a large colony on the Crozet Island, and they are feeding they are very specialized, they are feeding on mictophid fish, very small uh, fish uh, that are very abundant, super abundant, probably the largest uh, resources in the Southern Ocean are mictophid fish. And there are very few things known about this mictophid fish in the environment. 
And so we have tracked these uh, penguins that are breeding on the Crozet Island by using uh, this kind of logger. So it's an Argos transmitter. It gives you the location of the bird. And you can see that these birds, they are traveling. They go at sea. They leave the colony. They're traveling up to a very specific area, which is called the polar front. So it's a meet, meeting of the uh, warm, uh, of the uh, cold Antarctic waters with some Antarctic water. So it's a very productive area. Uh, and so they are g going there, and they stay there for foraging. So we have used specific loggers. So in addition to the uh, Argos logger or GPS, we are using loggers that can record uh, when the birds are swallowing prey. So it's a whole sensor that is put on the beak. At each time the bird is opening the beak, it's uh, monitored and recorded, and we can count exactly the number of fish that uh, uh, the bird is catching. So, for example, for this trip of the, this bird, he caught 2,500 uh, prey, so uh, mictophid fish. Here you have the profile for the day of the trip, so it lasted about a 10 days' trip, and the depth at which uh, the, uh, the mictophid fish are caught. So, you see that the birds are uh, uh, diving up to 250 meters to catch the prey. And each small dot here, you have numbers, it indicates you when the bird exactly caught when it was uh, diving, uh, when it was uh, uh, catching this microfeed fish. So first, the bird is moving to the south, uh, to the, so, uh, the south polar front area. And you see that it's catching at 200, uh, three, 250 meters some mictophid fish, but not a lot. And as soon as it's reaching the, the polar front, you see that it's diving not as deep, so at two, uh, 100 meters, 150 meters, so at shallower water, so it's a much, much lower effort for him to catch the prey, and he catch all the prey, most of the prey are caught in this area. And after the bird returned to this colony, and again, a few prey are caught, and after it returned uh, on the colony to feed the chick. We have recorded this track of the bird over uh, more than 20 years now. And you can see that, in fact, all the tracks here, the position of the polar front on the area, you can see that the polar front is moving from one year to the next. Some years, it's very close from Crozet. Some other years, it's much uh, further away. For example, here, if we just look at a small part of this uh, track, you can see that in 1994, it was traveling only at 300 kilometers south from Crozet. And in, in 19 97, 98, it was traveling at 600 meters, so much further away. And if you look at the dive effort, so the, the number of kilometers, in fact, the bird is diving, if you put all the dives one after the other, you see that it's diving much more in 1997. So in fact, 1997, 98, it's an El Nino year, a very warm uh, uh, period. You see the sea uh, level elevation is high, so this means the water are much warmer than the previous year. So when the water are warm, the birds have to go much further because the polar front has shifted to the south, and also they are diving much more because the, the, the mictophid fish are at uh, deeper waters uh, to be caught. So big change from one year to the next, whether the water are cold or warm. If you look at the change in the population size here, you see that population had increased in the 80s. And at the time, the water at this very warm event in 1997, 98, the population had declined very steeply. And the, uh, the survival of the birds was very low during this uh, uh, warm uh, periods. If you look at another colony, a very huge, it was the largest uh, uh, penguin colony in the world on the uh, Ile aux Cochons, so another island, which is a bit further away from the polar front. In 1982, this colony was 500,000 uh, pairs. So uh, it was 2 million birds in the, in the colony. But when we flew over the, the colony in 2016, it's very rarely visited, this colony. Here was the previous uh, colony border, and we see that now there are very few birds, only a few uh, uh, small uh, part of the colony are, uh, rely, are, are resting uh, in, the, in the area. And we use satellite images uh, from uh, over the past 20 uh, years, and we saw that, in fact, the population has passed from 500,000 uh, birds in 1980 to today, it's 65,000 birds only. So we have lost about more than 1 million birds in the colony. So it was a huge effect on the colony that we monitored, but also on remote and very large colonies. 
If you look now at what will happen in the future, so using the modeling of the IPCC, what, how the water will change in the area in the next uh, 100 years, it's clear that, in fact, the polar front will be shifting to the south. This is uh, clearly shown here, the distance from the Crozet Islands to uh, the polar front. You see that today is 400 kilometers, and it will be six to 800 kilometers in 100 years. So this means that, in fact, in, even in 50 years, we will be in the condition that we had during the very warm year, uh, the El Niño years in 1997. So this means that, in fact, the population will not be able to rely no more on the polar front. And this is clear here. Here is a polar front with a different colony where king penguins are, are breeding today, with the shift of the uh, population from, 19, from 2050, probably the population on Crozet, Kerguelen, and uh, Marion Islands, they will be not able to, uh, to be sustainable, and so they will disappear. The only population that will be able to remain will be on Heard Island. So this is an example of how the climate change probably will affect this, uh, uh, this population through an effect on a very, a very specific oceanographic feature of the polar front. Another example I want to uh, I will talk to you uh, is about wandering albatrosses. So wandering albatrosses are very large bird. Uh, they, they breed on small islands uh, around the, the Antarctica. They are large birds, so uh, eight to ten kilograms, three hundred, uh, three and three point five wingspans, so huge uh, birds. Uh, and uh, we have monitored this population over the past 60 years. So here we have the change in the population size of the uh, Crozet uh, Island uh, population. Uh, you see that population have dropped, have declined in the 70s and 80s. It has increased, and now it's sta stabilizing and uh, slightly decreasing. So what could have caused this uh, change in the population? So of course, we are thinking at climate change, and one particular uh, uh, specific uh, um, specificity of this bird is a bird that is relying extensively on wind. So he is using the wind as a, he climb uh, against the wind behind the, the waves, and after it increases, and the, the wing strength will increase with the altitude, and after it will uh, uh, do a long soaring flight uh, among the waves. And uh, by using this kind of wind, we have shown, for example, that uh, with this uh, the track, we have tracked this bird from Crozet. And just to give you a, a, a scale of the movement of this bird, when, just when they are breeding, not uh, when they are migrating, just when they are breeding to bring food to the chick. For example, this trip uh, corresponds to a bird breeding that would bred in Brittany here in France, and would go in uh, off New York to feed and return uh, on, the, uh, on its colony uh, in Brittany. So it's a very huge, uh, long uh, movement of this bird. And this is made possible because they are using the wind as a, as a, for the strength. So they are using the wind to take altitude and after to do this, to do this long soaring flight. So, and we have shown that by using loggers that record heart rate, for example, that when the birds are flying, are in flight, the heart rate is almost the same as when the bird is resting on the nest. So they are using no energy because they are able to use the wind. And they are using the wind by, different, uh, by using the side winds. And also, the stronger the wind, the, uh, uh, the quicker the movement is. And so over the past 20 years, there has been a, 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 a very uh, important change uh, in the wind strength in the uh, Southern Ocean, so because of the ozone depletion and change in COD, CO2 in the atmosphere, there has been an increase in the meridional pressure gradient. So this means that, in fact, the wind has increased, and also the areas where the, the strong depression are passing in the Southern Ocean are shifting to the south. So this is evident for when recorded to Crozet. So this is the wing strength on Earth. You see that the Crozet area is, is the, the, the area with the strongest, wind, strongest wind, uh, on Earth. And you see that the average wing strength and, has increased over uh, the past 20 years uh, in the Crozet area. And also, if you look at different latitudes, it has increased, especially uh, at the latitude of, of Crozet and close to Antarctica, and not uh, so further north uh, in uh, subtropical uh, waters. So what are the consequences for the birds? The birds are able 
to travel much faster because of the wind. Uh, the wind is stronger. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, traveled much faster, and also their range has shifted to the south. So this means they are not uh, foraging no more in subtropical water. They are shifting to subantarctic and uh, Antarctic water. So very important changes in the distribution and in the uh, travel speed of the bird. And the consequences are very important, for example, the duration of the trip, the time it takes them to find food at sea has decreased by 20%. Uh, the branding success has increased, and the mass of the birds has, has increased by one kilogram, which is huge, in fact. It's a, they have taken one kilogram more uh, over the past 20 years. So this means that overall, for wandering albatrosses, climate change has been, has been positive, in fact. Branding success has increased, they are traveling faster, uh, they, are, uh, they are in better condition, but Still, this doesn't explain why the population has decreased. So in fact, we have looked at other factors that might affect uh, this population. So the decrease in the population was due to, in fact, to a low uh, adult survival, especially uh, the survival of females. And the present decrease here is due to a lack uh, of recruitment. I will not go into details, but we have shown in a previous study that, in fact, the low survival, so the high mortality of the bird, uh, in the 70s and, and 80s were, were due to a mortality in long-line fisheries, especially in long-line fisheries for tuna. So what's the problem? Albatrosses are attracted by boats. They are attracted especially by the bait. And when the line is put uh, in the sea, for example, for long-liner for tuna, the line are up to 100, 120 kilometers long. So very, very long line to catch tuna, uh, sharks, and many other species. The albatross are attracted, they take the bait, that are small fish or small uh, squids, and they are, uh, they are hooked and they, are, uh, they sink with the, with the line. And so it's estimated that every year about 100,000 uh, albatrosses and petrel are killed every year because of this kind of fishery in the Southern Ocean. So that's why we were interested to gain information on this uh, fishery, especially because in the Southern Ocean, especially around islands, there are legal fisheries and also illegal fisheries. So very few information on this uh, illegal fisheries, especially. And very few information also in international waters on the tuna fisheries. We don't know exactly on very broad scale. We know that there, are, there is an effort for tuna, but we don't know where the different uh, boats are operating and which uh, countries are operating exactly. And around the island, around Crozet, Kerguelen, especially, there is a legal fishery that, are, that is catching uh, Patagonian toothfish. And uh, also there are illegal uh, boats that are operating. We don't know where exactly. So because of this, and because of this low recruitment in the young, we have been, uh, we have been founded by the ERC to study, in fact, the, this young birds that are leaving. And so the idea, we have tried to find an, a way, in fact, to know when a bird was behind a, a boat. Because, in fact, we have not the location of the boat except for the legal fisheries operating in the economic zone. So, in fact, we had the idea that any boat that is fishing anywhere uh, is using a radar. So we develop a specific logger so with a GPS, but also with a radar detector. We can uh, uh, receive the emission of the radar and uh, uh, report it on the logger. Uh, and after, it's, uh, we can download the logger and have the information where the bird was and when it had encountered uh, a, a boat, a fishing boat mainly. And this is, these are the results, for example, all the blue tracks are the track of the bird from the uh, colony on Crozet. You see that they are traveling everywhere around the Crozet Island, and each uh, yellow dot is a radar detection, so a boat that has been detected by the boat. So you see that the birds are extensively uh, foraging on the shelf around the Crozet Island, and they are encountering quite a lot of boats. And this, for example, is birds that are traveling behind boats that are following boats that are returning to Rainan Island. But also, uh, what was interesting, that in fact, we had the, this bird are most of the reported boats that are uh, fishing legally in the area. So there, it's a fishery coming from Rainan Island for Patagonian toothfish. But also, we re recorded illegal fishing boats in the EEZ. So using this bird, this boat were not, not, not known to be fishing there. So with this in mind, in fact, we had another funding from the ERC, so it's a proof of concept. So it was, the concept was, in fact, to use the seabirds 
by using loggers that record radar, but also that can send immediately by the Argo system, that can send the information immediately to have an immediate information on the location of boat that are encountered by uh, albatrosses. So we had this large program in 19, uh, this year, so during the, the winter, the idea that in fact at each time a bird encounter a boat, any boat, uh, the information is immediately transmitted through the Argo system. We receive it at the lab in Chise. We compare the information with the AES. So IAS, it's automatic information system. Any boat should have this system so that you can know where boats are. So it's uh, mainly it's, it was used first uh, for anti-collision between boats, but any boat in the world uh, uh, can be located. So you can see this here. It's a map, for example, at an instant T. You can see all the boats in the southern Indian Ocean that are located here. So red are a fishing boat, a red, green are a transport boat. So you can, we can compare the location of the boat detected by the albatrosses and the AES. And so this was done in collaboration with the CROSS, which is a, the authority that are regulating all the, uh, the boats in the southern uh, Indian Ocean. It's, it's army uh, rated uh, 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 control. And in fact, the idea that in, in case there is an illegal boat, even if there is a Navy boat around, it can control uh, where the boats are. So this is all the tracks that we had, uh, the birds were, were, were uh, fitted from Crozet, Kerguelen, and Amsterdam Island. So we see that we have a very good, very large coverage of the area, 40,000 million uh, uh, square kilometers. We had 600,000 uh, uh, locations uh, of uh, the birds, and we were able to locate 350 bird, uh, boat vessels, mainly uh, uh, fishing vessels. This is an example, for example, in the EEZ, so economic zone around Kerguelen. You will see that all the yellow dots are the boats that are detected, and we have some boats. For example, here, a boat that is not known uh, as a fishing boat uh, by the uh, legal fishery. Here is another boat that is uh, it's a Spanish boat that is known to enter in the, uh, the EEZ. So here the boat is... Uh, uh, with it's known to be uh, this boat, and after it enters here, and it's, it, it stopped the AES, and so it's no more uh, identified because it's uh, fishing illegally, and after it's returned. So we can see this with the bird. And so in total, so this is what we had uh, for, this, uh, for this program. So this is the zone in blue, the zone that we were uh, uh, monitoring with the bird. And we have the declared uh, AES, so the bird with the AES system, uh, uh, so declared bird, and all the illegal or not declared boats, because when they are in the EEZ, they are considered illegal. When they are in international waters, they have no AES, but they are not illegal. So you can see that there is quite a large proportion of uh, non-declared boats in uh, international waters. So more than uh, one third of the boat had no AES in the international waters. In the uh, French EEZ, there are a low number of, uh, uh, of uh, illegal boats this time, so they are not uh, fishing with a license. So it depends on which EEZ. And for example, in the South African uh, here, uh, EEZ around Prince Edward Island, no boat wa uh, was. Uh, uh, had an area, so there was no legal boat fishing, but there were only illegal boat fishing in this area. So this is just to show you that it's possible to use these uh, seabirds as indicators uh, and even as informators about the fisheries uh, 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 that were not uh, available so far on especially what is the amount of illegal or non-declared uh, fishing boat in the ocean. So with this, Thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was really interesting. So maybe I can ask one quick question, which is, I mean, um, now that you know you can track them, um, is there any way that you could use, um, you know, that the boats could be hooked up with some system to deter these birds from actually, um, you know, going to their deaths? Yeah. In other words, some kind of detractive... Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so it's very... Uh, uh, it has been developed over the, 20, the last 20 years. In fact, uh, there are several systems that uh, allow birds not to be caught. And so the first system is to uh, set the line at night, for example, because albatrosses are, are diurnal uh, birds. You can... Uh, 
uh, put, uh, put more weight in the line so it can sink. Uh, there is also uh, what is called Tory lines, which are uh, uh, lines that uh, uh, do not allow the bird to go on the line. So in th this, in fact, for example, in the EEZ mm -hmm. around Crozet and Kerguelen, it's compulsory for all the fishing boats, but only for the legal boat. In international water, these systems are not used. So that's why the mortality is mainly by illegal boats and by uh, legal boats in international waters. Yeah. Okay.